Paul Sandalo, heavy hitting boxing, one of the best gyms out in the Northeast. What's going on, Paul? That's it. How you doing? Thank you very, very much. Very nice talking to you. Good, good, man. Good. Let's uh, since you are a man of the sweet science, you know what's up. Let's talk about Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder too. Listen, the most amazing part about that was, if anybody remembers, Tyson Fury said, I realized something in the 12th round, okay? He realized that Wilder could not back up. Now, something like that is extremely rare because of one reason. Did you see what happened before he noticed Wilder couldn't back up? He got knocked down. Yeah. Uh, big rarity in boxing that this man was able to get up, overcome the knockdown, overcome the round, and not only that, realize what the key to victory was going to be. And look, it showed he played it down. He told the world, I'm going to knock out Deontay. And the world said, you're crazy. And uh, clearly he wasn't, but uh, clearly he wasn't. Do you think there was a psychological advantage going into this fight, the second fight, because he got up from that knockdown? Because it looked like he was dead, you know, and then, you know, Deontay thought he won the fight. And then he got up like the Undertaker and came back and won the fight, right? Or You know, you know he won the fight. Come on, the first one. What do you think? Come on, he won the first fight, and he knew that, and Deontay knew that, okay? Um, and the crazy part is Fury wasn't in the shape he should have been fighting that fight. Um, and I think, like you said, psychologically, Wilder knew that Fury was going to come back with something a little different. But in all reality, Fury did what he's been doing his whole time. You know, he came back from depression. He came back from the weight gain. He came back. People don't realize that uh, he fought Klitschko and put in an amazing fight, and the world didn't care about him after that Klitschko fight. Um, and that's hard as fighters, you know. We do this for a reason, not only for ourselves, but for a prideful. And he won the fight. He won the biggest goal in the world that nobody cared about. So it's amazing, absolutely amazing. What do you think about the excuses that uh, Wilder's coming with after the fight? You know, is it kind of, is it a shame? Do you think it's kind of shameful? Listen, here's the thing. Could a 45 pounds do that in 15, 20 minutes before the ring? Yes, slightly. Is he a professional athlete? Yes. Um, there's a list of things, guys, you know, in all my years of watching fighters that they can make excuses about. But the thing is, when the bell rings and you're in the cage or you're in the ring, it doesn't matter. Um, plain and simple. Uh, we can make excuses about everything. And there's plenty of problems that arrive fight week, never mind the day of the fight. It's about who shuts up, goes in, win or lose, and keep moving to the next day. Yeah, definitely. Uh, did you see the video that came up, like him on the uh, on a podcast where he was talking about how he trains with a 45-pound vest on, so he gets yeah, he simulated? Yeah, which is crazy. I mean, we have them in the other room. We put them guys on the stairs. I have my guys do the hills. Um, the hardest part for me was Breland. You know, Breland's a New York guy. We're New York guys, and I hated to see a lot of the controversial about, you know, should he have thrown in the towel or not. Listen, we, our us as coaches are here for one reason, and that's – to protect our fighter. Obviously, we're here to mentor, to train them, to bring them into battle, but it's also to protect the fighter when he cannot protect himself. Um, and that's pretty much it. I respect Breland, uh, which I'm very happy to know that he's keeping Breland on the team right now, which was great, because at first they thought he was going to fire himself. Yeah, I, I was, like, very confused about that. You know, like, why would you fire your trainer that's trying to protect you? You know, it would have meant a lot of bad things about Wilder, I believe, yeah. if he did fire his trainer for that reason. Yeah. Well, I think he's smart and he realized, you know, what Breland did. You know, I think any educated person that's in boxing, when it really comes down to the nitty gritty, understands that. And if you don't, you shouldn't be with the person anyway. You know, me as a coach, if one of my fighters doesn't respect a decision like that, that may have saved Wilder's career and life, then you shouldn't want to be with that fighter, vice versa, coach either. Um. Have you seen the other video that has come out of uh, Fury? Like, they're breaking down the fight, the second fight, and it looks like he's his fists are at the, the wrist part of the glove? Yes, yes. You know, what do you think about that? There's always, uh, there's always glove issues, man. There's always, always glove issues. It's out of control. It stems from, man, there was a guy out of the Bronx. Uh, my brain is getting a little out of it, but he fought a very top Irish fighter years ago. Um, and they took the padding out of the glove. Um, so there's been plenty of issues with the gloves. We all know Margarito. Listen, it happened, it happened. Fury fought amazing. Let's all just soak it up and move on with the fight game. Exactly. You know, the commission's there to protect the fighters, especially the gloves. You know, like, you're not going to adjust the gloves after the, the commission checks anybody it out. That's in, 
been in the pro game knows what yeah. happens before you go into a fight. We realize how much they suspect. They check out everything. They check out the gloves. They check, check out our shoelaces. Okay, they check out everything. Um, so pretty much anybody inside the back room is really not the truth. What do you want to see? Do you want to see the trilogy, the third fight, or do you want to see Fury go fight uh, Joshua? Uh, to be honest, I don't think I want to see the trilogy because Wilder's amazing, but if they have the fight within six months to a year, there's not that big of a jump that he can make to compare to Fury's technical boxing skills. He'll always have that one knockout punch, of course. You know, nobody can ever take that away from him, but, you know, the skills have to be there. There's levels to this. There's a reason why people say in MMA and boxing there's levels. There is there's levels to it, you know. And Deontay has always had that diamond of a knockout punch. He's been able to get over on anybody. Fury just outshined him that day. Yeah, it's like Fury has a toolbox and Wilder has a hammer. Has basically. A hammer. Yeah. Maybe a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah, a sledgehammer, right? Maybe, uh, maybe a sledgehammer, yep. How how do you see the the Fury Joshua fight going down? Do you feel like Fury's just too good? Like he is the the best boxer in the world right now, like heavyweight boxer at least. I think. Listen, Joshua fought Ruiz by moving and you know boxing and being technical, and he still wasn't even close to what Fury is in his technical ability. So there's pretty much no way he can do that to Fury. Um, you know, so I see that match pretty much not going anywhere. All right, all right. So, but I want to see it though, right? You want to see it, right? Listen, I want to see it, of course, for the hype. Um, mm -hmm. Listen, let's face it, Joshua, he is to that stage. He's an amazing boxer. He's an Olympic style boxer. So, in six months to a year, can he develop other tricks in that toolbox you were talking about? He definitely can. That's the difference between Joshua and Wilder. Now, with with this resurgence, or I guess the rebirth of the heavyweight division and a lot of attention towards boxing again with Wilder, Ruiz, uh, you know, Fury, everybody, right? Now, does it, does it have any kind of impact on boxing gyms, do you feel? Like, do you feel like there's more people, like, wanting to not not fight, but, like, just come and train a little bit and, and um, have, have a yeah, sweat? Definitely. I mean, listen, boxing within the past 15, 20 years has kind of commercialized. Um, everybody wants to do it to your soccer moms, to your pro fighters, of course. Um, the difference is I do notice, obviously, more population comes into the gym. Um, it def definitely helps our sport. The hard part about our sport is the era that we're in, you know, with kids. The dedication factor is not the same. Um, you know, the social networking, the media, the technology has really changed the sport. Um, you know, boxing is a sport of you lose, you come back the next day and you train, that's it. Um, and sadly, a lot of kids we see come into these gyms and the second they lose or they don't do well or their media outlets don't show what they want to see, they go goodbye. And you know, that's not really boxing, it's not MMA. Boxing MMA is about fighting from the ground up, win, lose, struggle, pain, injury, no matter what it is, we lift ourselves up. That's what we're about, you know? Before we shift to MMA, I wanted to ask you last question about boxing. Who's the best boxer of this current generation, in your opinion? Whew, that's a hard one. Um, you know, technically, I still couldn't say Mayweather. I really just really couldn't. You know, in this generation, you mean within the past, you know, 10, 20 years, you're thinking? Or you let's, know, let's say we know who the best boxers are in the past 10, 20 years. Let's yes. say this generation let's, of like the last five years to the next 10 years. I love Crawford. He looks okay. amazing. Um, in a boxing style, I thought Mikey Garcia had a lot to show us before his last yeah. loss. Um, I just think he was overpowered, and he was just a little too small. Um, but as we saw with his fight this past Saturday with Vargas, you know, he is so technically skilled. Uh, amazing. I like a couple of the up-and-coming boxers, of course. Um, we've got an amazing guy out of my city, Stanford. That's 16-0, uh, Cordell Booker, who is one of my technical favorites, and I've been watching him since his first, first amateur fight, you know. Uh, Marcus Brown was the top guy coming up for her. I loved his technical skill. But I got to say, Garcia and, you know, probably one of my top guys out. All right, let's get into uh, your gym, man, your heavy-hitting boxing. I know you got a That's team it. of boxers. And on top of that, you got guys coming in, MMA fighters coming in. Uh, talk about some of the guys that you have right now that are coming up. You know, give them some shine before, or yeah, you know, yeah. you know how it is. Well, you know how it is. Yeah, like you gotta yeah. give them some shine before they become yeah. famous, and then you'll be like, "Hey, I told you this guy was gonna become something." Yeah. Well, it's funny because last week I loved that Marcus in his interview. He turned the camera, 
we showed a couple of our heavyweights. We have a, uh, we have two big Polish heavyweights uh, out of our gym that are big up and coming fighters. Uh, we have a Ukrainian heavyweight that won 15 and 0, won the Golden Gloves in New York, Connecticut, the whole East Coast. Um, you know, named Igor Laba. He was a big sparring partner for Luis Ortiz and Luis Garcia from the Cuban, the Cuban refugee camps. Um, you know, we have another big uh, Jamaican fighter, Christian Brown, is here. He's a very good fighter. You know, we have a lot of young kids, 14-year-olds, 13-year-olds. We have a Korean fighter, actually, too. He's actually here right now. <laughs> He's actually here working out. Uh, Min, come here. Come get in and say hello. Because I know Mike wanted me to introduce you. You've got a Korean fighter over here. This is my Min right here, Korean fighter over here. How you doing? So, so we're, big on, we're big on just having every coach. You know, I don't care where mm -hmm. you come from or what you are or what background you are. Come on in and let's get to work. Um, now, yeah, you have a big, you have a melting pot. You just mentioned Jamaican, Cuban, Ukrainian, you know, like or Korean. Fighters, Jamaicans, uh, Haitian fighters. We got um, Ecuadorian fighters, Brazilian fighters. We're everything. I don't care who you are. Come on in. Let's get to work. Now, with yourself, you know, did you... You know, you're you're a trainer. Like, how long have you been training fighters for? Well, let's see. I started boxing when I was around eight, nine years old. Come from a troubled background. You know, brother, sister, father, nobody graduated high school. Father was in prison when I was born, and boxing was my way out. I started when I was eight. Um, around 19 years old as an amateur, I broke my back in two spots, my L5, and doctors looked at me and said, your career is over, goodbye. And here I was, a 19-year-old kid, and I looked at them and said, what do I do now? <laughs> you know? Um, what happened about, I took about five, six years off from boxing just because when that happens to you and your whole life is fighting, you don't want to see it anymore. Um, then I met my wife, I've been with my wife 17 years, and we went to a boxing show, which I never would go to. It just hurt me too much to go watch. You know, I came up with like the Delvin Rodriguez's, um, you know, guys like um, Augie Sanchez, who's the last guy to ever beat uh, Floyd Mayweather, actually. Uh, Pat Barry was his father in law. He was the one that got. Knocked out on the stretcher by Prince Asim Ahmed. Remember Prince Asim? Yeah, yeah, of course. We're all trained partners together. And, you know, my career didn't pan out. I was supposed to be this big pro, and I, I wasn't. One day we went to a fight. My wife looked at me, and we watched the coach go in the ring. And she looks at me, and she says, you know, you're not done. And I sat there, and I said, wait a second. Maybe I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was about 12, 13 years ago. And now 180 fights left later. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you, brother. Yeah, <laughs> <I was laughs> that's... A... <laughs> You know, a negative into a positive, and now my whole life is coaching them. When they get in the ring or in the cage, I get in the ring in the cage with them. You know, that's how I live. Yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. You know, like we could go ten hours about like from yeah, the beginning to just, the start, right? But that's a that, we'll get you on again. We'll talk more in depth the about the it. yeah, it's the struggles strong. of that. But twelve, that's thirteen years. You know what? Seventeen years or twelve, thirteen years? Twelve, thirteen uh, years, 12, right? Twelve, thirteen years for the coaching, mm -hmm. full time. Coaching. Okay, for the coaching. Uh, I came back and fought like a, a quick little fight in '07 just to tell the doctors I can do it, um, and then I said I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> you know, let's get, leave it to the young kids. Um, I actually have post concussion syndrome uh, from getting hit in the head, so I'm I let the other guys get hit. Having that experience, you know, when you're younger and then going through kind of like the struggles, there's nothing that can come in the future that you can't handle right it's like you can give advice to kids coming up you know your fighters that they can actually yeah. take to heart because you've been through the the, the grind of you know yeah. getting you know t having almost everything taken away from you and then you getting it back at the same time right yeah i mean you gotta fight you gotta fight for it you know your whole world as a kid the sad part is a lot of kids they strive for it they want to box they want to be an mma and they think that that's going to save their life that's going to you know, make them millions. And I tell people, it may not make you millions, okay? But what boxing and MMA did for me is it gave me structure and it gave me a plan. No matter what, if I'm 10 years old or I'm 80 years old, I still have boxing and MMA. It does not matter. I can go in my basement at 60 years old when life is going bad or good and I can hit a bag and I still have that. And that's one thing that's important. With the MMA guys, right? You got Marcus, yep. he was in there and he's got a fight coming up. And I've, I know, I've seen that you've worked with other MMA guys. What's the difference, man? Cause you know, you have the straight, straight boxers, but then now you got to make the adjustments for the MMA guys. It must be something, you know, that is very difficult. You know, some coaches right. might say, oh, it's not that hard, but to be honest, you know, you got to study a lot and, 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 and get into a deep, right? Yes. Well, it's very difficult because 
a lot of the MMA guys, they have different styles. They came from either wrestling backgrounds, Muay Thai backgrounds, you know, karate, jiu-jitsu, you know, pure boxing. Now, what I try to do is I try to blend them together in certain ways and keep them separate at certain times. So my MMA guys, they need that pure boxing. So I try to give them that dose. But believe it or not, my boxers benefit from my MMA guys and the grappling and in the clinches um, and the strength wars inside the ring, okay? Um, we try to base everybody as an individual. That's the only way to do it. That's the problem, I think, with a lot of gyms is they look at everybody as a whole, and that's not the truth. Every fighter is different, mentally and physically. Uh, that's the hardest part about the fight game, right? Is everybody's a different individual. And let's face it, to get locked in a cage or in a ring, you know, you have to be a different animal. Um, so you have to take one individual at a time. When you go through a training camp with an, an MMA fighter, um, mm -hmm. like what are the drills? Do you have to change up the drills, you know, compared to a regular boxer? Like what uh, kind of drills yes. would you drill somebody? So normally what we do is, you know, we usually do six to eight weekends. And normally what we do is the first four weeks, um, we stay strict boxing. So they're getting only mainly pure boxing, okay? I don't want them to get lost in the MMA scuffle. I mean, don't get me wrong. All my guys are Henzo guys. So um, they're all down in, at Henzo's doing their work. Um, you know, so I don't have to worry about that aspect, which is nice as a coach. I only have to worry about your stand-up, which is amazing. Um, another thing about that is, you know, with the camps, like you said, we veer off. Then we get into the MMA around week five, week six. Then we start adding the kicks, the knees, the elbows. And around week six, we go full blast with about two weeks left, where we're doing everything, ground, top to bottom. We're doing the stand-up. And then we kind of have the pure boxers kind of fade away from the camp. Nothing against them, but they kind of fade away into the into the air. We go up to five minute rounds, and then it's party. Um, having you know the 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 fighters from Henzo, you know mm -hmm. th that gym is world famous. You know you got a slew of Amazing. guys, right? Amazing. You know it's just it's just great knowing that. I mean, I'm I'm looking out my gym window and I see Metro North, and you know that train goes into Manhattan in 30 minutes. Just so. Amazing that the opportunity of the guys should just get on, get off, go quick, and know they're getting the best training around. And know I'm comfortable. I don't have to worry about it. There's not even a thought in my head of if they're getting treated correctly because we know they are, which is a, a big deal. As well. So do you like that position right now of just having guys come in and then you can just focus strictly on the boxing and you're not trying to be somebody that's, you know, you see some of these guys that are trainers and they're boxing trainers, but they, they all of a sudden they become an MMA coach out yeah. of nowhere right when you see that out sometimes it's kind of very odd right how somebody can transition so quickly yes i mean you know the best part to do it is you know we have our kick coaches you know me i have my guys that come in and hold kicks obviously i'm familiar with kicks elbows knees i know all that stuff been doing it for years but i'd rather have somebody come in so i could specify my training for one way and have them do their way and then also what that does is relieves a lot of stress off me the coach yeah. You know, um, mental stress is something people do not understand about the fight game. So yeah, exa it's exhausting, right? Like the mental side is more exhausting than the physical side, probably. I'm gonna have a big headache tomorrow because you know tonight I got about ten guys coming in from all over the tri-state getting ready to. You know, this is Marcus's last heavy week of sparring, so uh, the mental of uh, me watching and focus, focus, focus. Never mind the nerves. I mean, listen, the fight's next Friday. You know, so everything's got to be on our P's and Q's. You got to peak at the right time. It's all a process, brother. I look at it as where a coach can, you know, when a gym is full and everything's going on, there's sounds going on everywhere. And then the coach, it mesmerizes me sometimes. A coach just zoning in on one fighter as they spar and then being able to kind of shut everything else out and, yep. you know, zero in on that and then be able to tell them what they need to do and what changes the thing. That's just amazing. Like, not a, a regular person can't do that. Yeah, why well, I tell people this is people are shocked when they say this is when you're in the ring or you're in the cage, you it doesn't matter if there's 10,000 people, you hear my voice. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we do certain little tricks where we scream. I scream on the bottom of the cage or the bottom of the ring so I vibrate off the bottom, okay? Mm -hmm. People don't realize that it helps you listen, but... They only hear your coach. Same thing, vice versa, is I'm trained to have him. I'm him. I'm like his remote, but then he only hears the coach. Like you said, it's, it's very amazing the way fighters do it. You know, I know you also have 
the the other side of your gym where you have regular people coming in and that yeah. do you it must be fun that's like the kind of fun too right to have like kids and and like moms come in you know like just just yeah. just training and and yeah. kind of reaching their goals too you know i tell people like this i say when it comes to boxing and mma you're not getting in trouble for hitting the back it doesn't matter if you're releasing stress aggression you're an ex-drinker ex-smoker ex-drug you don't want to hit your boss, your kids. You don't want to abuse somebody. You're coming in. You may be miserable walking in here, but when you leave, you leave smart. Or you're leaving a little more relaxed, and you're leaving with a positive. You know, it's a positive release. And, you know, a lot of kids, we do our kids' from programs daily, which are chaos, of course, because they're kids, you know, but they mean nothing but fun. Um, you know, like you said, it's just amazing to watch the different diversity. We have five-year-olds come in. So I have an 82-year-old man that comes in and hits the speed bag, and I think he hits it better than most people in the gym. I don't know how, but you'd be surprised. Are you going to be heading to uh, Connecticut with Marcus? Yes. So we got we got uh, Mohegan Sun uh, this upcoming Friday, the 13th. So we'll and then be where will you uh, be the next couple months? Like, where are you going? Who are, Who's fighting? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, we work with uh, a couple other big MMA guys, like Vinicius de Jesus is another one of our big guys in our stable over here. Um, he was an ex-Bellator fighter, four or five fight for vet, and then he went over to CES, won the title over there. Um, so, you know, he's still weighing his options on figuring out what he's going to do. Um, we've got a couple other Bellator guys coming in tonight that are going to get some work in. Uh, we're going to Bermuda in May, actually. we got a couple fights going in Bermuda, which is going to be very nice. Uh, you know, I love traveling to different countries. So much, you know, especially warm ones, especially when yeah. it's warm and nice. You know, and I think we got California coming up in about four or five months. But besides yeah. that, you know how the fight game works. I always say yeah. you don't have a fight till the bell rings. Exactly. You could have a fight in two weeks. You don't know. You'd never know. We could have a fight and go all the way up to it. And the day of the fight, the fight yeah. gets cut. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a very crazy sport. Yeah. Well, that's why everybody loves it. Because it's crazy. Hey, nothing like it in the world. Man. Nothing like it. It's the biggest drug in the world, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, I look forward to it, man, to see you uh, grow in, in the Northeast of the United States is just full of talent and people are just starting to just starting to see it right now you know especially on the mma side boxing has been around for a little bit but the mma side is starting to burn you know blow up right it's amazing for the sport it's amazing just for the transition it's amazing that you could turn on tv on a friday night and now watch live mma and you're not paying a fee you know it's just doing nothing but growing our sport which is amazing it's all we could hope for i mean i tell people this is when I was in high school, there was no such thing as universities having boxing teams, maybe one or two in the country. Now UConn has a boxing team, NY, Cornell, they have boxing teams, meaning you go to these events and you have the street gyms, which is a gym like mine, mm -hmm. and then you see a team come in with University of Connecticut uniforms on boxing, which is amazing. You imagine your son being able to get a scholarship for boxing? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Definitely. Well... Uh, appreciate the time paul man uh, uh good luck much. to you your gym everything that you're doing man uh hope most likely i'll be seeing you on in the corner somewhere sometime yeah, i'll and, be in uh, the corner next friday night i'll be in the corner so definitely definitely appreciate it man and uh good luck on everything and and you know all everything man your gym your family life everything man it seems like everything's going really well for you thanks so much you too keep doing amazing interviews brother all right take care <laughs>